All right, so we're going to segue into our next um, speaker, uh, Matt Chatsey. Oh, there he is. I There's see Matt. your beautiful face, Matt, on the screen. All right, so Matt has 30 years of experience helping leaders define and implement, which is important to implement as well, innovative solutions to environmental and business challenges. He's leveraged this foundation of systems thinking. Um, what he does is he helps people analyze complex challenges and build solutions that incorporate science, technology, economics, and a bunch of sort of social dimensions um, to achieve effective and longer lasting results. And all of his great work started with a degree in science, technology, and society at Cornell University. Woo, big red. Uh, Matt is also a member of our 2023 advanced certification cohort with the Cabrera Research Lab. He's also the instructor for E. Cornell's executive certificate in systems thinking. And he will also be one of the very first guests on our new podcast series, which is titled Think X. So I'm pleased to in introduce our colleague and also our good friend, Matt Chatsey. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Laura. And I'm uh, really excited to be here, and especially to follow uh, the Violence Project um, uh, panel. I think you're going to hear a lot of things. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, climate. Let me just set up my presentation here, uh, talking about climate, but a lot of the same themes are um, going to be throughout this talk, how to think differently uh, about policy, how to train policymakers to think more systemically, and how to take a, a community well-being um, view of these problems rather than one at a time. So I think all those things will We'll come clear here and it'd be fun to, to compare notes and, and figure out how we can advance some of these ideas together. So um, again, today I'd like to talk about my two, two favorite topics, uh, climate and climate adaptation and systems thinking, and talk a little bit about how um, I have brought those together over the last year or so to try to understand why climate adaptation is um, stuck in a lot of ways and how we can, can advance it. As you all know, climate is an enormous global issue. It's getting uh, worse by the year and will continue to do so for decades to come. So it's something we, we certainly need solutions for and uh, we need to do better. So first I wanna share a little bit like any uh, good systems thinker should about my perspective, how I come to this topic and how I'm, uh, how I'm thinking about it. And my career started uh, many years ago in the Bay Area, working pretty close to where this image was taken on upland marsh restoration. So hands re hands on restoration uh, along the San Francisco Bay. And that continues to be a really important component of climate adaptation. I've also done a lot of uh, benefit cost analysis, helping people understand the holistic benefit cost analysis of natural solutions to climate. And that means not only the hazard that you're reducing, but also all the other benefits, all the other opportunities like recreation and habitat and, and other good things that can come from your investments. So this has been a, uh, an ongoing discussion for, for years and now FEMA and uh, large organizations, our uh, governmental organizations are really starting to include these ideas in their work of holistic benefit cost analysis. The third is helping communities apply for adaptation funding. Uh, and specifically through FEMA, there's approximately $5 billion a year now in the U.S. going to adaptation and helping to uh, write the grant proposals and working through that process has really been eye-opening. And then the final piece I'd like to share is I've been working with um, community organizations, community-based organizations around the country, um, helping them marry the climate adaptation activities that they're doing with building equity and well-being within their communities, often underserved uh, communities with many other issues, high pollution and uh, traffic and, and all sorts of other uh, challenges that they're facing. So on top of all those, I've, I'm a parent, I've, uh, I'm a snow lover, I'm a gardener, community member, so there's lots of different ways that I've incorporated all these things to think about um, climate. And the short story is we need to do things easier, faster, and more holistically. Um, we just can't go at the pace we're going now and meet the, the demands that are in front of us. 
So the plan for the next uh, few minutes or 30 minutes is to talk a little bit about my definition of climate change and adaptation. I wanna make sure we all have a shared model and um, that we're talking about the same thing. I wanna share a little bit about how I've used systems thinking to uh, dig into adaptation and why the barriers exist and how we can potentially address them. And then I wanna suggest uh, next steps, both for myself uh, what I'm planning to do and for you, whether you're a climate practitioner or just uh, an ordinary citizen. Before I go on, uh, this picture is, uh, they say a picture is uh, worth a thousand words. This is a image from the fires in Alberta, Canada that was taken a week ago. Um, as you can imagine, Canada used to be a snowy place. Uh, fires might not start until July or even August. And through climate change and a variety of factors, there's already a million acres that are on fire in Canada, a hundred different fires. And you can tell from this image, this is not just a uh, simple grass fire working through a meadow. This is uh, a whole new kind of fire. So this to me is an indicator and there's many others that things are uh, not changing in the future, they're changing today. And the solutions we need um, need to start today as well. So first thing to be clear on is what is adaptation? So you hear a lot uh, in the news about mitigation. So mitigation is reducing the amount of carbon that is going into the atmosphere, uh, things like electric cars or ma uh, mass transit or home uh, efficiencies, things like that are all reducing the amount of carbon, as is sequestration. There's many, many projects now, of, uh, different organizations trying to pull carbon out of the atmosphere that we've already released. So this is not what we're talking about today. Uh, we're talking about adaptation. And the uh, definition here is a little awkward, but, but also important. So adjustments in ecological, social, and economic systems in response to actual or expected climatic stimuli to moderate damages or benefit from associated opportunities. So a couple of things to pull out here. One, we're not just talking about the ecology, we're not just talking about the fire and the forest, we're talking about all the social and economic systems as well. Um, it's not just what's happening today, but the expected uh, changes is an also an important part. And I've especially underlined the associated opportunities because many of the adaptation efforts that happen today are focused purely on the hazard and do a fairly poor job of looking at the broader opportunities that could um, improve our communities and their well-being as well. So again, this is a lot of words. A simple way to say it is we are trying to make the best of things uh, as the climate changes. So what are climate hazards? There's a few kind of major hazards that you've certainly heard about, sea level rise being one, a wildfire, uh, inland flooding from intense rain, uh, drought is one you're hearing more about. The Western United States is in a decadal or more drought in California and, and elsewhere, even though they've had you know, recent snow and, and rain events. Uh, and extreme heat is one that you're hearing more about around the world as places that used to be 80 degrees or like in Seattle where I live, um, it's 114 degrees a couple of years ago. And so extreme heat is becoming much more prevalent and much more of a concern for a variety of um, reasons. In addition to these commonly heard ones, there's a lot of others. Uh, I talked a little bit, there's intense rainfall sort of separate from flooding that were extraordinarily intense events cause damages. Um, there's persistent rainfall. We now have a new distinction, a new word for systems thinkers, which is um, an atmospheric river. And that's where basically Pacific water just hits the Western US and it just rains constantly, basically for days or weeks. Um, and that causes a whole new set of problems, including potentially dam failure and things like that. Uh, coastal erosion is another invasive species, probably don't think too much about that, but they're following the, the temperature changes and the precipitation changes, uh, causing enormous damage in many parts of the world. Uh, groundwater rise is a new one uh, to me recently. The uh, I learned how when sea level rise is happening, it's also pulling up the groundwater, which actually resuspends a lot of toxics from landfills and underground storage tanks and things like that. Uh, and also in, it gets into the sewer and water systems and does quite a bit of damage. 
So that, that was new even to me. Uh, reduced sea ice is causing issues, uh, especially to native communities in um, northern areas where they used to be protected by sea ice. And now the sea ice is breaking up earlier, uh, exposing them to more fall storms, which is creating uh, enormous hazard uh, for many of these small isolated communities. And ocean acidification is another, which may be the, the least obvious to see, uh, but is changing the way our ocean dynamics work. So I just wanted to share these. Uh, and as systems thinkers, you'll, you'll certainly see that there's lots of relationships between these. Uh, there's tons of flooding post wildfire. Uh, there's all sorts of interaction between these different hazards. And it's important to know those and think about those when you're designing um, interventions. So the next thing I want to do, and I'm, I'm a mapper at heart, uh, Derek and Laura uh, know this, and uh, I love to, to draw maps to try to understand what's, um, what I'm looking at. And one thing I want to show just quickly with this is that when we talk about the impact of these hazards, it's not just the forest burned, and then you can sort of move on to your next discussion. It's really a, a community, uh, the whole society and economy is affected. Um, this specific example I, I put here just as a, to illustrate this idea is longer fire seasons. Fire seasons used to be um, 60 to 90 days, basically July 1st to the end of September, maybe a little bit into October, uh, especially in the Western US and Canada and Alaska. Now the fire season is nearly all year long. It's probably 10 or in some cases 12 months. There's fires into December, there's fire starting in March. Um, so what that does, there's larger, more frequent fires. Uh, there's more ecosystem damage here to the, uh, to the right. Um, and that releases more carbon, which is not only increasing the, the fire likelihood, but also affecting the public smoke, for example, or flooding is affecting the public. Um, that has a big public health impact. There's physical, people with asthma and things like that uh, from smoke, but also mental health. There's a huge mental health strain uh, if you've ever lived in a city where there's wildfire smoke hovering over it uh, for months or weeks at a time, there's definitely a significant mental health uh, and physical health because you can't go outside and do your normal activities um, uh, result from that. People affected also all these, the health and the effects uh, drag down the economy. The economic well-being of the region is, is drained to some degree. Um, as is having to provide an increased budget for people fighting the fires and, and the seasonal firefighters and so forth. And so this is just a quick look to show how these issues flow through uh, the entire economy and community. And you know, as these hazards get more significant and as the uh, and there's more of them, this path is sort of tread many, many times for for different hazards, and it has a, a real impact on the community. So I'd like to shift a little bit. So that was a lot of the bad news. So uh, let's shift a little bit and talk about what adaptation is. And conceptually, it's really simple. Um, this is an example from um, uh, the International Institute for Sustainable Development. And essentially, it's just showing an example of uh, sea level rise and coastal storms. And this community has done a number of things to um, to adapt to this condition. So one is putting in some artificial reefs, which reduce storm surge and reduce wave height. Uh, similarly with the perched beach has a similar benefit. Uh, plant stabilization dunes are a wonderful way to uh, reduce storm damage and planting them with uh, native grasses and so forth can stabilize them and protect them in a large event. Uh, there's a salt marsh, which again provides an additional barrier and this home has been elevated to, um, so if flood water gets to that level, it can pass under the home without damaging the living area. Um, so these are all examples of adaptation. Sometimes they'd all be done together. Sometimes just one or two would be done. Uh, it's important to notice here too, that there's co-benefits, right? So there's habitat for fish and, and animals. Uh, there could be uh, recreation. There's bird watchers and scuba divers or snorkelers. Uh, could come out here as well. So there's lots of co-benefits for the community. So looking at this, it's pretty simple. We can do some adaptation and uh, solve our problem. But the reality is incredibly complex on the ground. 
this is a San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, there's many, many hazards. Pretty much all the hazards happen around the Bay Area. There's many jurisdictions. So there's local, state, regional, counties, uh, special districts that are all interwoven across this area. There's diverse ecology. There's uh, mountain, mountain areas, forested areas on the edges. There's a great estuary of the San Francisco Bay and Bay Delta and many other ecologies as well. And the communities are very diverse. There's very dense urban um, high income communities. There's uh, underserved communities, both urban and rural throughout the area as well. So applying these simple adaptation concepts in a area like this, there's much to learn. There's much to learn about the science. There's much to learn about how the different um, government agencies can work together. And there's much to learn about how to most effectively work with the, um, the communities. So again, easy in concept, difficult in the, on the ground. So I'd like to shift now to talk a little bit about how I've applied systems thinking. Uh, basically, my goal is better understanding of what's happening and clearer options to move forward. Um, I've used a specific approach, the agent-based approach. And essentially, agent-based approach seeks to identify uh, the, the agents and find out the simple rules that are running the system. And you've probably seen this in uh, probably recently, maybe in the last couple of days, um, the, the flocking starlings, right? They're simple rules that are essentially stay pretty close to my buddy, uh, turn when my buddy turns and avoid predators. And those rules make you know, amazingly beautiful structures like this, emergent structures, but uh, they also convey um, you know, some evolutionary benefit to the, to the birds as well. So my goal in doing this work is to find the simple rules uh, that are driving adaptation and see how, if and how, we might be able to affect them better. So the agent-based approach in, in my talk, I, you know, I wanna provide some sort of larger uh, ideas, but also some specific steps. And so uh, these and these are, you see these steps in slightly different orders, but for today, um, there's really five steps. Really, one is to understand the, the overall system and its purpose. So, the, so to really dig into the system, uh, identify the agents that are working within that system uh, and the simple rules that they're using, and then develop some principles and recommendations for how you can make the, the system better and how the rules could be applied in a better way. So that's what I'll be talking through for the next few minutes. So my first step, and this is not super easy to read, but um, it was to do a, a very detailed uh, mapping of, uh, from my perspective and, and working with some other folks with expertise and different components of what the adaptation system really looks like. And I'll walk you through it again. This is a very highly simplified version, but just to give you a sense, um, you have your climate threat. So that could be one threat. In this example, the Bay Area, it could be many threats, as I just talked about. And that threat will, oops, that threat will get uh, mixed into the community priorities, right? So it's not only about climate. Uh, it's about, as we just talked about, it's about gun violence. It's about homelessness. It's about schools and health and all the other priorities that the community has. And so um, this is a really important component. And we'll talk some more about this in a minute. The other thing I wanted to understand is what is a community? You know, in a sense, you think, at least I do, you think of a community, you think of just individuals living there, but really the community includes the businesses, it includes the uh, nonprofits and community-based organizations. Uh, there's developers building housing and, and, uh, and many others as well. So it was important in my analysis to really understand specifically who the community is, how they're acting. There's some that are more engaged. There's some that are sort of disengaged uh, and determine how that's affecting the community priorities. The next piece, which is important, obviously, are the politicians, right? And Derek was talking about this a few minutes ago about how the politicians, you know, the, the community votes them in, uh, but they also, once in power, they're running the, the government. So they, they're getting a lot of forces acting on them. And they're also responsible for um, distributing the, you know, the resources of the of the agency or of the community. 
So again, a very important component. The all of that work, both matching up the community priorities and the politicians' direction, uh, leads to planning and action planning. Essentially, what are we going to do? What are we going to do about climate? What are we going to do about our other priorities? And then the final step is to allocate funds and resources to actually do the work on the ground. Um, so there's a couple of things that aren't on this chart, but just to mention, you know, one is funding sources, and there's many, many funding sources from government grants to bonds to taxes to uh, all sorts of other ways that funds come into communities. Another major piece that's not here is around um, the science, right? The science and engineering about how you're making these decisions, especially around climate. So uh, imagine some extra boxes with those as well. So the next step of uh, the ABA is really to look at the possible. The, the idea is the purpose of a system is what it does. And so to use a simple, simple example, if you eat too many donuts, um, it's not just that you're eating too many donuts, but it's probably a problem, a larger systemic problem. Do you have the right food in your house? Did you eat a good enough breakfast? Uh, where do you sit in the office? You sit next to the donut table or far away from the donut table. Um, so the idea is that the system you're in right now is perfectly oriented to uh, make you eat too many donuts. And if you want to change that, you need to change the underlying system. So that's a simple kind of silly way to look at it. But my uh, so I want to look at the same thing, look at my previous uh, chart and look at what that system is really good at doing today. And, you know, and, there, and I will say, you know, there's certainly highlights around the world of communities that are doing uh, well, doing better in many of these areas, but I think many would agree. Uh, and it sounded very similar to uh, the previous discussion as well, that these are pretty common problems and pretty significant problems. So one is we're creating siloed single hazard responses. There's people working on the flood problem and people working on the fire problem and so forth uh, that aren't necessarily working together uh, and matching up and looking at kind of a multi-hazard approach. Um, often ignoring community well-being and uh, just, again, focused, overly focused, in my opinion, on the hazard itself. Special interests, I think, often get um, additional uh, over, overweighting of their ideas and their um, power to affect decisions. And I think that, as I said originally in the underlying part of the definition, we really fail to pursue some of the broader opportunities. We're investing literally tens of billions, hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, likely be trillions of dollars uh, in the next couple of decades. And that creates an enormous opportunity to do good things and to change our process and change our way of working. So um, I don't think we, we are, uh, this system is currently not geared toward pursuing those opportunities. And then finally, I think it really frustrates everybody. It's too slow, it's too expensive, it's too complicated, it's too confusing. Uh, the list go, goes on, but there's, there's, I don't think, there may not be anybody in the planet who's excited about how well we're doing climate adaptation these days. So that seems to be an indicator uh, that some things could be improved. And when I look at these, this one really stood out to me. Um, and again, it, it sounds very similar to the previous discussion, um, really ignoring the overall community well-being and, and taking this single, uh, single hazard sort of quick response view. And so thinking with this in mind, and then coming back to my earlier, you know, personal goals, and I think many goals to make it easier, faster, more holistic to, to get this work done uh, is where we're heading. So let me take a step a little bit deeper now. And when I first started looking at the more complex model, it seemed um, uh, overwhelming, really, frankly, to me. There were so many things going on. You have all these interactions within the community. You have the interactions between science and engineering expertise and politicians. And, and there was just this sort of giant map that was uh, confusing. And I, I couldn't tell you know, where the place to intervene was. And then it really dawned on me that this is the simple um, step that everybody is doing at every level. And it's just thinking about the hazard, making a plan, and implementing the plan. And it's really as simple as that. And that's happening throughout. It's happening 
Uh, these are, you know, potential players here. It could be an agency leader of a billion dollar agency. It could be a citizen looking at doing, you know, a little stormwater project on their street. But, but really this simple process is happening all the time. So to me, that was a sort of a calming uh, discovery and really simplified the, um, you know, the entire map in my mind and, and some of the ways that the solutions could potentially come about. But that said, we still have this problem, the Poswood problem that this approach is creating um, problems. It's, it's, it's not achieving the goal that we want. So, uh, so what can we do? And the other thing I would say too is that you know this is is oriented around uh, you know can again be at any scale, also. So what do we do? The I, I propose two steps um, that are very important. One is focus on the community, not the hazard first, right? So the community, as I said, there's lots of other priorities in the community. There might be multiple hazards. And if you come at this from a, a perspective of community well-being, I think there are a lot better decisions we've made and decisions can actually be made more quickly. Um, the second is to focus on the long game and not immediate results. And I think uh, someone said that also a few minutes ago. Um, there's this tendency to wanna just fix things. We're gonna put up a seawall and now the waves won't come over it for another you know, 10 years and then we'll figure out what to do then. And to get away from that uh, mindset and get back to um, a slower, more thoughtful with lots of feedback plan to build and test and learn um, as any uh, system thinkers should be doing. So what does this look like on the simple map? There's just one relationship added, right? So we had the, what we had before, but now we're really aligning with the community well-being priorities. And this is, both general community well-being, but ideally the individual communities are saying how they want to be and how they want to balance their different priorities. Um, and so this creates one new uh, alignment, one new relationship, and it, it goes, now the actions are both supporting the community priorities and also hopefully reducing the, the hazard. So it's a pretty, um, pretty simple step. And again, it's, it's easy to uh, explain and to think about. Uh, but I think it can also be pretty powerful. So what does community well-being me mean? And I would love to hear if, uh, if others on the, in the session you know, have ideas of, of models that are powerful for community well-being. I'd love to see them. There's some in the UN. I've done quite a bit of looking. There's many models around specific things like you know, opiate use or schools or things like that. Um, I haven't found sort of a comprehensive one that quite fits what I'm looking for. So if you have ideas, I'd love to hear them. Uh, but just showing, and this is similar to my other map, uh, you know, health, um, social networks, it turns out the social networks are very powerful for both making better decisions and innovation around climate uh, and also responding when there is a climate disaster. The communities that do best to recover best are ones with high social cohesion. Um, you know, equity supports social networks and equity are, are related in livability. Uh, they all support the economy. So really looking at all these elements and probably some others um, is a critical part of that community model that, we're, uh, that I'm talking about. So what's, what's a way to, what's an example then of this sort of approach with a specific project. So here's, uh, and I'm not actually sure, I can't find the name of this building, but it's, it's pretty cool. Um, this is you know, a multi-benefit type of project, right? So this is hitting pretty much all of those community well-being elements. Uh, it's reducing heat island. It's reducing the urban heat uh, by having green space. It's probably capturing stormwater. So it's managing a couple of different hazards. Uh, it's likely reducing the cooling costs for the building. So it's reducing the economic burden on the owners uh, of the building. Uh, having green space has been proven to be better for people's uh, mental health. Having being surrounded by nature is something that's very good for them. Um, it may also develop some local jobs. This is sort of a new uh, uh, expertise to take care of infrastructure like this. And so there's new jobs that, that can be generated, uh, local jobs to keep money in the community. 
So some a simple project like this can benefit all the different elements around the, um, the social uh, and community uh, model. So the decision-making principles. Um, so with ABA, you want to have principles that really should not be violated when you're making um, decisions and, and actions within the context. And I have three simple ones here, and this is sort of an abbreviated list. But one is that any action must be aligned with the community, community's own well-being model. Um, so you, you can't do stuff that is not. Um, the second is that the, the actions must not negatively impact any of those. So if you have a you know, great flood project, but it is terrible for health or for the economy, um, you need a really, really good reason to be able to do that. So ideally, you would never do that. But if you do, it needs to be very transparent and clear why you're um, making that change. And the third, and again, this gets back to just systems uh, understanding and working with systems in general, every action has to have an evaluation plan with the funding and the path to share the results. And it's sort of un unimaginable how we spend tens of billions of dollars and a lot of things fail and no one really goes back to look at what failed. So we're not learning, we're not making the system uh, better over time. We're just sort of tossing things out there and hoping they work in many cases. So uh, these are long-term evaluation type plans. One thing will be clear uh, to you here is that most communities don't really have their own well-being models now, right? They have very specific models, again, ar around health or education and things, but um, there's not many with these holistic models. So this is this is work to do as part of this. And then the last step for the ABA is recommendations. One is, um, uh, you know, that we do need to create these community-based models of well-being. That's that's an important step, or at least get a generic ones that we can start testing uh, against the climate, uh, specifically for climate adaptation uh, components. The next, and this is exactly mirroring what was said previously, you know, we need to, the planners and the public policy people need uh, awareness of both the broader community well being, of systems thinking and multi benefit planning. And they just need to be able to think differently. And this is not at all to be disparaging to folks who are water engineers or uh, public health experts, but just the way the system has been for the last many decades is they're very individually focused. And we have to get more training for them, and we have to get new folks coming out of uh, school with these skills, and we need to really figure out how to make this transition quickly. Um, and then the third is really get used to sharing results for the public to see, have an accessible forum to be able to see the status and progress over time. Um, and again, I don't think we're good at that at all. We see these snapshots of you know how many shootings were today or whatever, but we don't sort of think more holistically and over time about how things um, are going and where we're making progress or not. So to summarize, climate is uh, complex and will get much more so. I think we really don't have any idea uh, how challenging this is going to be. The Bay Area is planning for four to 10 feet of sea level rise in the next uh, 50 years, 60 years. Uh, we like to think, you know, the news sort of talks about millimeters, but there, there's some scenarios where it's going to be multiple uh, five plus feet of sea level rise. You think about that for areas around the world is pretty striking. Um, I think system, I don't, I really can't imagine anybody could argue that systems thinking is not a requirement for future success if we continue to not think this way. Um, and there, I don't understand how we could be successful. Um, and I really do strongly believe I've been using these tools for a number of years now, and um, I know I think differently about these problems. I can much more quickly uh, get to uh, solutions and ideas uh, than than I ever could before. So I really do think they're quite powerful and, and also quite easy to teach and, and learn. So next step, what's next for me? I'm, I'm going to be planning on... Um, hoping to build some templates and some jigs that uh, for communities to help connect the uh, the planning and community well-being and, and tools to help them make uh, make this easier and pick up some of these ideas. Uh, and the second is to help grow systems thinking skills 
uh, through mentoring, consulting, case studies, and, and training to uh, to take some of these ideas and do some very specific training on it. And I have a, a what's next for you too. So uh, anybody who's here listening, I mean, this everybody's interested in systems thinker. Some of you may be climate uh, professionals. Uh, there's just uh, regular citizens doing other things. But I think everybody needs to try to apply your your system thinking skills to climate discussions, whether that's at work, whether that's you know with your kids. Um, you know, taking some of these ideas and and advancing them is very important. Uh, second, I'd love if if everybody would take the community well-being perspective whenever you can to really, you know, step back and think how the things relate and how climate and homelessness and uh, health and all these things relate because they do in a very integrated way. Um, and challenge others to do the same. Try to get some more uh, folks to to join and to start thinking, you know, again about all these problems. I think thinking from a community perspective brings in you know, all the different topic areas and, and becomes one discussion around community, which is important. So last, uh, thank you for, for listening through all of these uh, talks about hazards and damages and things. So I want to give you a picture of a puppy uh, to, uh, to end the day. Um, there's nothing more fun than, <laughs> than a puppy with a nose full of snow. So uh, I'd like to especially thank the Cabreras, Derek and Laura and Alina for all the support, uh, thinking through these ideas and also uh, my friends at Systems Thinking Daily and uh, all the support and learning that I've had there as well. So thank you all, appreciate your time. Very good, Matt, thank you very much. That was a great talk. Um, there's a lot of questions and I'm trying to summarize some of them so I can kind of, there's definitely some themes and um, uh, you mentioned at the very beginning and then again at the end, uh, the, the idea of easier, faster, more holistically, right? So more systemic, we need it to be more easy to do, obviously, but faster came up uh, at the beginning and the end. Um, and it it belies the the issue around climate, which is similar to other time pressured crises, which we have a lot of. Um, and we often emphasize that you know you can do fast and right and adaptive uh, rather than fast and wrong or slow and right. Can you say a little bit about your own practice and whether you've seen increases in your speed? and your accuracy and in your thinking or the thinking of your students. Laura mentioned that you teach the systems thinking course uh, for, for eCornell. So you not only have your own thinking to look at, but you, you get to see student thinking um, from all over the world uh, as a result of applying DSRP and systems thinking. Give us a little bit of your thoughts on, on those, on that. Absolutely, yeah. And one just on the fast, um... I think fast in this case is a relative term. There are uh, grants or some some grants that you apply for and you may not hear for two or three years whether you have won it, won it. and um, climate is changing faster than that. So the things that you ask for the money for probably are not even the same things as when you get the money three years from now. So uh, so it's, it's not a rushing sort of fast. It's more of a less than three years sort of fast. Um, but yeah, so I think these ideas, I mean, to me, I feel much more capable and much more um, uh, skilled and zeroing in really quickly to, especially around distinctions. One thing that I've noticed, and I talked a lot with my students about, we use a lot of terms like resilience or sustainability or, um, you know, community engagement and things like that. Just we throw those terms around constantly and no one has any idea what they mean or they mean something different to every single person. And um, and that's really damaging, I think, because people think they kind of are, are agreeing or, you know, they're just sort of saying it because it sounds good. Uh, that's a resilient community or whatever. But people don't get to the level like I've, uh, you know, the, the diagram showing all the different elements of community well-being and what specifically is impacting what. And so to me, one of the most um, valuable things I've learned is to be able to really quickly uh, sort of see those distinctions and start breaking down the parts of things and that's made me a lot faster um and it's allowed me to ask a lot better questions right uh when i'm when i'm in a policy discussion or, or working with somebody because they'll just throw those out and kind of move on it's like whoa let's go back um 
one uh, you know one thing that people say is the you know the problem is defining the problem, and that that happens again in climate a lot, right? So people have a very specific thing, and they don't look at the causal effects, they don't look at the related symptoms and things. Um, and I'd say that's true with you know students as well. When they in my classes, when they start thinking that way and they start sort of breaking down, they just get a whole nother, they get a level of an actionable level, I think, of um, where they can make better decisions, right? They're not just talking in generality, but it's like, oh, to do that, we need to do these three things. And that's that's really powerful for them. So yeah, I think faster and more accurate in my my personal situation and also with my students. Yep. So I, there's a lot of, of talk, a lot of questions about the specifics of, of what you're talking about. You're somebody who engages in, in climate change and sustainability and adaptivity and all these, like you said, resilience, all these different uh, issues. Um, but I want to, again, kind of zoom into less about what you're working on, more about how, mm -hmm. uh, because that's really the whole point of systems thinking is that that these topics can be very different, but we can apply the same sort of approaches and uh, or approach them in, in similar ways. Um, obviously, if people are interested in Matt's work, you can go to Nonlinear Ventures, you can contact Matt and, and follow up with him uh, about the specifics of his work and all the crazy cool things that he's doing. But in this, uh, you used ABA, agent-based approach. And yesterday mm -hmm. we saw um, Ian Cousin's work on agent-based modeling, A ABM. We, Laura and I developed ABA because ABM is, while it's an incredibly powerful tool like Ian showed us, um, in the policy space, in the social technical systems, it's often not feasible to do an ABM. We saw some of the complexity that, that Ian is, is developing, the software, the technology, the rooms that he has are very high resourced kind of stuff. So agent-based approach or ABA was designed for this kind of, um, when you're dealing with complex systems, but you don't, you can't, it's not feasible to use ABM. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about um, how using ABA on top of DSRP, kind of what are the benefits? What does it do for you? Um, mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's interesting because I um, I love the idea of ABM and you know and, and some of the technical you know certainly in, in climate specifically there's some feedback loops and modeling that can be done that's pretty powerful that that is useful. Um, but certainly agree that ABA is um, you know it's gives you that kind of mindset without without having to spend a million dollars on software and and collect terabytes of data that aren't right. existing. Um, I mean, to me, I think what's most useful for it is just, again, thinking with that mindset of how to uh, look for simplicity, I guess, or simple rules, you know, how to how to look through them. And what I said in the talk, it really, it was really interesting because I, I literally, I had this huge map. I'm like, I have no idea where to start. And Laura and I went through this on a, a few discussions, you know, it's like, should we look at the science and how it relates to the, you know, the government staff, or should we look at how decisions get made? And ABA it just keeps sort of pulling you out to look, you know, how can you simplify this? It's, it's sort of a, I guess it's like a mathematical, you know, common denominator. How can you kind of, what what fits all the way through? Um, so to me, the most valuable part is really the, the mindset um, and being able to, you know, test some of those, those simple rules. I think the hard thing, you know, unlike the modeling and the challenge of it with ABA, and it's, you know, it's, it's a big step forward, but it's still, you can't test how the rules are going to work, right? Because if you're not modeling them, um, and so that's where you come back, where you just you have to have a lot of feedback, do all the regular casts, you know, things of getting constant feedback, having very clear goals about what you're trying to achieve, and, and keep adapting as you go. Um, so that that's the part that's a little bit hard, but um, to me, just coming at it with a sort of structure and, and looking for that simplicity is is really important. Um, and DSRP, you know, it's really kind of elemental in a lot of ways on under the whole uh, process. So just making better distinctions and and uh, seeing relationships just supports that process of the ABA of, of finding and, and reorganizing until you have that simplicity. Does that answer your question? That was a little bit roundabout. Yeah, answer. no, that's absolutely right. Um, you, you also did, uh, you looked at the, the um, 
recommendations or the your specific recommendations, but also your what you call principles, which we sometimes call a recommendation rubric. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit of the, about the difference between those, because a lot of folks uh, pleasantly come back to us and say, that was really powerful. The, the doing the rubric or the principled rubric um, is, is different than the recommendations, but very valuable. What's the difference between those two things and why are they valuable? Um, I, I mean, I think the, the principles of the rubric is, is really important because it Again, it gets away from the sort of generalization of like, oh, we'll sort of apply these, you know, these ideas, and and it, it gives you very specific structure about sort of pass fail binary structure about how you're how you're applying it in, in each step. Um, and I think that's really, especially around climate policy. You know, there's a lot of things. It's like, oh, well, you should have a permit, but we're going to give you a, a waiver, you know, and maybe get your permit later because we just need to go fast, so we're just going to skip all this you know, all this stuff, all this analysis that we need to do. Um, and so, you know, it, it gets away from that. It's right. If you don't have the answer, you can't move forward. If you don't, uh, if you don't communicate, if you don't test against a community plan, you you can't go forward. Um, so it, it gives a much more easy to follow sort of binary decision tree, which, uh, which I think is useful. Um, to me, the recommendations are more, and um, I'm not sure I'm, I'm a, Think about this the same as, as as you are necessarily, but the recommendations are more really how you move forward with implementing the overall yep. you know program that you're you're coming up with. So that's really the difference. One is more from the decision maker perspective, and the other is more programmatically. You know how you're going to make progress uh, and what needs to be done next. Excellent. Yeah. So I want to read two uh, things that uh, one a person said, and then another person uh, Matt said. One's anonymous. I think the penny drop for me, our thinking creates our systems, i.e. capitalist society, which causes these effects we see as wicked problems. Changing my our thinking is the new project. First, become aware of current thinking before change is possible. I know that habits are hard to change. Is thinking easier to change? Any practices you can share that help us improve our awareness of our thinking and then how to change it? Also, I wonder if there's value in sensing versus thinking. And then another one by Matt, I love all the specific application of systems thinking, seeing them together leads me to ask if we are witnessing systems of systems, SOS, how do we, how do all of the maps we are creating map together to eliminate the highest order problem that is the ultimate wicked problem all of humanity needs to be working on right now. And I think uh, there's a paper that we actually wrote what, called What's the Crisis? We can send you that in the, in the chat. Um, where we talk about the, the crisis that underlies all these different crises. And we've talked about many of them today. And climate isn't just one of them. Mass killings is, is just one of them. There's so many of them. And all of us are interested in different ones. But the one that underlies all of them is the crisis of cognition. And, that's, and the solution to the crisis of cognition is systems thinking. And, and you're really leading uh, on that share share with just your final thoughts on 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 that idea of the that we have all these crises but if we don't solve this sort of crisis of cognition uh you know we might not be able to get very far uh yeah absolutely i mean I, and i think that's what drove me to more of the, the sort of the community first model because that's something that's really tangible and it's something that um I, I think so much today we're driven by social media, we're driven by special interests, we're driven by, you know, scary things in the news about fires and, and whatever. Um, but if you if you reorient the thinking overall and come at it from kind of your community, your well-being and your your neighbor's well-being, then then that really that that's a pretty significant flip. And it sort of empowers, I think, the people in the community more than they have now. Cause I think that power you know, for decades, it's been drawn away by yeah. all the, all the stuff. Um, and so, you know, in a, in a way that's a, you know, that's a manifestation, I think, of thinking more holistically and thinking more, um, uh, you know, sort of proactively, innovatively, um, than, than, um, you know, we're, we've been taught to do now and we're, we're sort of used to doing at this point. Well, Matt, thank you so much. Can't thank you enough. And I uh, wish we had more time. I think the audience probably wishes we had more time based on all the questions that you got. 
but um, we have to move to our next uh, group here. So I'm going to get out of the this way. This is the magic move live. Great. Magic move live. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all. I appreciate it. And again, anybody follow up, uh, you know, direct with me if you like any more information. I'd be glad to talk to anybody who is interested. He means that. He will. He will talk to I you. Will. He always has great information to share. So thank you so much for that talk, Matt. It was very, very interesting, and I really enjoyed it.